wrong screen. Okay. Hold on. That's great. All right. So just to give everybody an update, um, I did uh, take Ukersh's code that he wrote in Python and translated it over to um, Golang. Um, and the reason for that was we needed the um, libraries for like IPFS and NFT storage and things like that um, that were not available in the Python world. So what you'll be able to do is create a new repository. Um, I'm going to prefix all of the new repositories with um, the SCEC, so Supply Chain Evidence Catalog um, is the acronym. And the repository is that one. It should be public. Let me change that. Somehow we got, I thought I made it public. Steve, how was the conversion process in your, um, in your opinion? <laughs> the uh, learning Golang was, wasn't a, um, a, a big deal. Okay. Uh, it's like a cross between uh, Python and C++. Okay. So that part went pretty easy. Um, one of the things that, so this should be public now for everybody to see. Uh, one of the things that I found was uh, even though um, Golang has what they call structures, um, it doesn't have a true object oriented um, programming world like um, Java does. Um, so in this example here, we have a, a user structure um, and we have all of our, our definitions here. Uh, and then if you want to associate a method uh, to a, you know, you can think of it as a class, uh, the user, what you have to do is you have to create a function with this type of definition. So this allows us to um, basically self-reference the user object uh, and that is like the method now. So like in Java, normally you have your class and then your methods inside your class. Uh, in Golang, you have to um, do them kind of like outside, which is fine. Um, it's just the way it, it they structure it. Now, one of the things that it doesn't have, even though you can do this, um, type of method definition is it doesn't have one for a constructor. So if you create a new user object, um, there is no way you can have like a default constructor go off and do things. So what ends up happening is it ends up having to do um, two different calls, uh, one to create the object and then a second call to go ahead and and do like a, an initialized one. Here's an example of one. So here we have, um, we're creating a new NFT object. Uh, and after it's created, we then, whoops, one too big. Uh, we want to go ahead and cr uh, call the init method uh, at that level. So it's a two-step process. Um, it works out okay. Uh, it's just one of those things you have to get used to. So what I ended up doing was um, I took every single object that we have and created a structure for it. Um, so you'll see underneath the model directory, um, all the different objects. Um, so the way they go laying links it out is you have your main uh, file. Um, in our case, each file is uh, equivalent to a, a, a class. Uh, and then underscore test is the test case that goes with it. Um, so one of the things when I was going through and doing the uh, the translations 
was I realized that we needed to do a custom uh, marshaller and unmarshaller. Um, and the reason being is when we marshal something to um, for IPFS storage, we need to exclude the key and the, the JSON string. So we really want just the raw fields. So in order to do that, um, we have to have a, a custom marshaller uh, go off and basically take the information that we want. Um, and that's gonna be our new structure. And what this is doing is we're actually calling the default uh, JSON marshaller for Golang. And we're creating a new structure um, that's excluding the key in the NFT. And we're setting all the parameters that we want. So in this case, um, for a user, a user belongs to a domain. And a domain has to be marshaled, uh, is going to have one of these NFT marshallers as well. So that's where you can see we go off and um, as we go do the mar marshalling here of the user object, we go and call the marshaller of the domain object. And what ends up happening is they, uh, when we marshal things, we create an NFT uh, structure. Um, and basically the NFT is just a placeholder for um, the key itself. Um, can and I what this, you, yeah. Sorry, can I ask you, marshalling, is that giving the, the NFT a, giving it life in a sense, like characters, characteristics? Is, it, is that what you mean um, by marshalling? Yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to, when we marshal something, it is going to um, take the contents of the, of this structure. So mm -hmm. somebody's already created the structure uh, and filled in like the name, the name and the email and the phone number and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. when we marshal it, we're going to marshal it to a, an NFT. Basically, what we're doing uh, is we're marshalling it into a JSON string. Oh, I see. Are you basically almost like a convert a conversion? Of it's that it's a conversion uh, process. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Thanks. I just want so, to understand the, the terminology. Yeah. So what we're doing <laughs> is we're converting it from uh, a Golang structure, mm. this user structure, into a JSON string that is going to conform to the um to the world that the ipfs um wants to to see it and i'll give you an example uh, here in a second um hmm. and when we do the marshalling if we have nested objects we have to go and marshal those as well and keep track of all that so it goes into this whole recursive uh, marshalling process so uh when we go and marshal the domain we don't want uh, the domain as like global to come back. We want the uh, the key that is going to be used to store the domain in IPFS um, to come back. So that's where the the these uh, the, the, the I had to create these these custom uh, functions to do uh, to organize everything that we needed it to um, lay out in not only the IPFS storage, you know, the NFT storage. But also in our uh, Arango, um, yeah, so it's like extract the data and map it to the correct fields in a way. Yeah, we basically it's a big giant data massaging process that we go mm -hmm. through uh, to make sure that we have the the data in the, the right order. Now, one mm -hmm. of the weird things is um, when you, um. I found that you actually, the order that you lay out the fields here is going to be the order that the JSON, um, so what this does is this just returns a JSON string of your structure. So um, one of the things that we need to do is to make sure that the we manually sort these fields um, so they're consistent. So if we go in and uh, retrieve the JSON from uh, like a, a Node.js program or Python that the order is maintained. So we just maintain an alphabetical order. So one of the things you have to do is to sort sort this list manually here 
to make sure that uh, things are coming back in the right order. Because one of the things when we start working with the IPFS storage and the SIDs, um, if you change the order, you'll get a different uh, SID. So when we go and calculate the hash of the data of, the, of that JSON string, we have to make sure that the order is being maintained. Um, otherwise, you get a different hash coming back. Because even though it's the same content, order makes a difference when you calculate the hashes. So that, that Marshall part is where we go in and take the structure and convert it into basically a, an NFT uh, JSON string. Now, we have to go the opposite direction as well. Um, when we go and get a, um, we have a JSON string or a, a key, uh, basically the IPFS SID, um, we have that and we wanna go backwards. Uh, one of the things that we want to do is uh pull that back and turn it back into uh, a, a regular structure so this is going the other way so we have the json um, or the sid and we want to go backwards to the um to the actual object this is the unmarshalling process uh, so, so are you massaging it back to its original form in a sense? yep we're, we're making um a uh, converting it from JSON back into the um, uh, the Golang structure, basically. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Cheap now, one of the weird. A, now, one of the weird things. It, it 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 is, but it isn't. It it actually mm -hmm. um, it took a little bit to figure out the the process and what we need to do and some of the limitations of Golang. One of the things that Golang doesn't have is a a method to do a deep copy. So it does a lot of things by pointers. Um, so even though we, so I could take this object that I am unmarshaled and I could just say, um, if I said, uh, uh, I unmarshal it into the user uh, variable. And then if I just say uh, OBJ equals user, um, it's literally a pointer reference and not a copy of it so one of the things that we have to do is to and what what, what that means is um somebody underneath the 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 covers could go change like the real name and if they update the real name they're gonna uh, it's whoever's pointing to that's gonna get the copy of uh get that real name update so what we want to do is we want to make a deep copy which goes and actually makes a copy of it instead of pointer references. Um, so when we go and unmarshal a nested object, what we do is we uh, set the um, the key of the, which is uh, the SID, um, make that available. And then the unmarshal, like you see here, will go and look at the SID that's coming in um, off of the object. So this looks for the, the object SID and looks it up gets the the json and then unmarshals it there so so, uh, so is a pointer yeah. kind of like a sim link in linux right yep instead exactly of, instead of instead of doing that you okay you need to actually change the data physically in a sense that's what you're trying to instead of just doing sort of like a sim link yeah okay. so instead of like in a in a sim link you have the you're pointing to the same file through the sim link mm -hmm. and what we want to do is we want to make sure that there's two copies of the same data yeah that makes sense so we can then manipulate um the 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 we can manipulate them independent uh, in, independent of each other without mm. uh, updating them at the same time yeah that makes sense so i'm going to go through a um and I wrote all the, we're just jumping over to another, um, let me go over to the user object first. Test case, a little bit simpler. So when we look at, um, so I wrote the test cases for all of these um, to make sure that everything was testing out. And so this is the, basically the, the, the JSON that would be, um, stored into the NFT storage. Um, anything with the key um, 
is ignored. So you'll see how we kind of use the, the key. So this is this representation right here is what Arango is going to look for. Um, so Arango has the underscore key is like the primary key of the object. So in this case, our primary key is this SID. And then like in the domain object, we're going to be referencing this um, this uh, SID, which references that um, that uh, that data. So when we go and change and kind of manipulate this, um, and we kind of flatten it out, uh, and we change this um, this this structure of all the JSON um, into uh, the corresponding data that's going to be put into uh, NFT storage. You can see when we go in and do the normalization. Um, right now we have like the the global is the name of the the domain. Um, that just gets replaced with just the the SID. So this is where we get this pointer process. And when we get into more complicated um, nested objects, you'll see how it. Um, we end up with this normalization and pointing to things that already exist and not storing a, a lot of data. So in this case, um, we have our, our nested domain, which is just going to be the pointed to the key. And then we have our email and all the other fun uh, data. And then we've added in um, the object type. Uh, so if we go look at the, if we go navigate to the IPF storage and pull up uh this uh this sid here um we can retrieve that doing just a, a a curl command basically we can go get that um that json back but we don't know what type of json it is and that's why we added in the object type so we can figure out what's happening there um so, so kind of that's yeah just sorry um so all this unmarshalling and marshalling in the end is so that um Arango can understand the data right is that yeah, what the so, code's doing basically. Yeah, so we need two things to understand the data. One is Arango, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. other one is NFT storage. And Arango gives us the speed, right? Arango is going to be where we're going to cache things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it so gives us the cache. we'll we'll That's add so cool. we'll add the data to the Arango database first because that's really quick, you know, mm -hmm. uh, milliseconds. And then yeah. when we add the data to the NFT storage. That could take up, you know, several seconds, uh, depending on okay. how how big the data is. Um, ah, so, so that gives the user experience better, right? Because it's going to be the user will be using Arango, whilst in the background, the NFT storage is getting the data written to and sorted out, right? Exactly. That's going to be the NFT okay. storage is going to be the permanent um, storage location. Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah. just to walk through kind of the um, the test cases, um, what we're doing here is we're going to create a, uh, a user object, um, a, the, the user structure that we have uh, defined. And what we're going to do is we're just going to take the default uh, marshaller um, that's built into Golang, and it's going to take this structure that is going to be like in Arango, and it's going to marshal it into um, that's that that uh, variable. So what that's doing is it's taking this JSON and filling out the structure that we have. Uh, so this this whole structure is has now been um, all the the variables that have been uh, populated now. Yeah, so that's like your conversion to the NFT storage, right? To store it there, uh, right? It's conversion from a JSON, uh, the Arango JSON format, into yeah. a um, a Golang structure. A Golang structure, and then this variable there, NFT to user. Oh, I see. Okay, is that the NFT? Is that is that the user information being stored in NFT? That variable. Um, what are this is, is this is the. Um, this is the first step where we take the Arango JSON format and we convert it into a uh, a Golang oh, user user. structure. Oh, the Golang user. Okay. okay. Now the okay. second step 
is where you're getting to is where we're going to take that Goldang structure and mm. we're going to convert it into the NFT format. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Which is, ends up being this expected line here. Is that also a type of JSON structure too? It is a type of yeah. JSON, but what we need to do is we need to normalize the data. So we want to replace all of the, like the name of the domain here, which is global. Yeah. It gets yeah. converted into this pointer. Uh, uh, that's of course. That we only point. So what ends up happening is we only store uh, the domain global once in NFT store, uh, NFT storage. And then every yeah, single sure. object that uses the global domain points to it through this, this key. Mm, that key is unique, right? Mm -hmm. the, key, okay. the key is basically a hash um, that gets created. And all this processing, is it quite intensive? Um, no, it's really quick. Really quick. Okay. It's interesting. Eh? Cheapest. There's a lot of lot going on between the, two, the data structures. Yeah, it ends up... Uh, um, yeah, Arvind. Does we have to hide the email and name as we are exposing it? Um, no, we can we can leave it exposed. So okay. doesn't anybody else uh, accesses the email and username through the password? Yeah, they would have to have access to the database to get to the email. Okay. Um, got it. So I, I have been thinking about that as well, where we, if we wanted to, and I've been reading up on this, where when we go and add things to uh, the NFT storage, that we actually go in and, and, and encrypt these strings as well. Um, mm -hmm. We'd have to see if we want to go that route um, and get into encrypting this string into some sort of... Um, like use an, an elliptical key or something like that to do, yeah. do the encryption and then store the encrypted data on uh, NFT storage. Right now, I just want to get it working and then we can get fancier down the road. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how does NFT, what kind of encryption does NFT file system support? Um, uh, none. None. Oh, okay. So, so you have to, to do it yourself. Own, you got to do it yourself. Okay. You got to use some sort of third party tool or some something. Maybe yep. it's, yeah, they can do it. Okay. Yeah. So there's GoLang packages for doing encryption of oh, data. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask if GoLang probably has something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just it's just a public private key uh, type of encryption. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. No, that's cool. Oh, okay. Cool. That makes sense. Um, the one that seems to be the fastest, uh, one of the new ones is uh, what is it? Ed one ninety five six or something like that. I'd have to look it up yeah. again. I think I've um, seen that around, yeah. But that's a an elliptical key pair uh, encryption that will allow encrypting and decrypting um, if you have the key. And overhead wise, is that still okay? Yeah, that's one of the faster uh, encryptions. Uh, okay. What it does is it creates a math algorithm that um, basically looks like a sine wave. So it what ends up happening because it's an elliptical curve. Um, yeah. the curve needs to be, uh, maintained. So if you change any part of the data, um, or any part of the key, um, you get a different curve and then they don't match uh, up. Okay. Cheapest. So the next step that we do is we just check, um, what we, uh, marshaled here and what we expected, um, come out to be the same. Uh, the I'm next just, step I'm of guess Yep. Sorry, I'm asking a lot of questions. No, sorry. Because it's kind of new to me. This is yep. new to me. Yeah. So this is basically the core of this whole operation, right? This, mm -hmm. this is this code is the core, right? Because it's the one doing the data massaging and changing and reverting, right? Yep. Okay. And giving the user experience. Okay, exactly. Cool. Okay. Cool, yeah, this right. is laying all the groundwork for the back end pieces. And then yeah, yeah. Um, the the front end piece is what this does is uh, when you're working with um, the microservice, the nice part is the microservice just needs to know that I'm going to get a user structure from 
uh, the front end. So I'm going to mm. get this JSON passed across uh, from mm. the front end that's going to uh, convert into this user structure. Will so, this be a microservice? Will this? Will yeah, there will there will be a microservice that goes in front of this. Um, yeah. Uh, that will include these uh, structures. And it'll be doing the work of the interchanging of data structures. Yeah, it'll be passing the data back and forth between the front end and, and the microservice. It's almost like the key to the to the different uh, castles, I guess, right? Yeah. Okay. Now <laughs> on the reverse, what we want to do is we want to take this um, expected result. This is what would be this is uh, what would be coming from the NFT storage. Um, and we want to take that and go backwards. So in this uh, case, yeah. we're going to go and take this data. Normally, this would be fetched from um, either uh, from the IPFS storage. Um, and we would take that and we want to go backwards. So one of the things that we need to do is to unmarshal that. And you'll see that there's this, um, this basically is a map. I uh, think of it a dictionary. Um, so when we go and marshal things, we end up with uh, the bits and pieces. So like the domain, because it's nested, we have to under we have to save the domain uh, and persist that into the storage. So this uh, SID to JSON is basically a um, what the contents of that is what ends up in I, in the NFT storage. Um, in this test case, what we do is we um, just create this the variable. Uh, when we marshal, it ends up populating all the keys into that uh, that dictionary. And now when we're going backwards, we're going to um, take uh, like the key here is going to be one of the keys that we need to look up. And the unmarshaling process knows to go and look look for the key inside of the um inside of that dictionary and go find the the json string and then go and do the recursive on un, marshalling so that's what that so, one so, yeah. sorry sorry steve <laughs> yeah um that said has that got anything to do with that domain key at the top or is it a completely separate key type of key it's going to be the same key it's the same okay so that said is that that NFT key, right? Um, it's a map of them. It's a dictionary of 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 them. And I'll give you. Um, let me go ahead. Uh, let me finish up here, and then. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sure. It's okay. So what what ends up doing it? We end up doing is we end up mar unmarshaling it back into um, our user object. So this is going to go back from all of the IPFS NFT storage formats back into the um Golang structure. Um, mm. And then what I do is I just go ahead and to make sure I get the um a, an easy way to do the assert um is I just mar marshal it uh backwards. So I mm. go forward and backwards and just to make sure that I uh, end up with my expected results. Um, we could write an uh an 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 equals function in the class. So in this class here, we could uh, write an uh, is equals um, uh, method and do the comparison. I just didn't have the time to go to that length. Um, mm. So I'm literally just going back and forwards between uh, the different structures to make my life easier. That may and be something we want to uh, change down the road. So NFT storage has its own unique key and um and uh Arango, does it what is unique in Arango? is that also that domain key is uh that, it is, is it, yes it's going to be the same is, key i don't know if i'm asking the right question sorry guys i'm a bit i'm a bit slow here with the programming side of things so throughout the whole process what is the unique key in that whole process is that that um, domain key it is going to be the um so it's going to be the so I, I mix up terminology here. So oh, okay. the I don't know, but it's complex. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, so this this key here, yeah, 
is the same thing as an NFT storage SID. Yes. Okay. Which is I, the I same thing okay. as a, an IPFS SID. So NFT okay. storage sits on top of IPFS. Yes. Yes. Okay. I was and just they both use how, how it's all being mapped together, right? Yep. So in Arango, uh, we're going to be using the same, the Arango key is going to be the same key, the same SID that IPFS is using I see. and NFT storage. So that way we can find data very easily. Yes, that's exactly what I was, sorry, I was probably asking it a funny way. I was just trying to understand how you, how you tying it all together, right? And that's, yep. that's, and that's how you're doing it. Okay. It all gets tied together through the, the IPFS SID. SID, cool. Okay. That makes complete sense. So and I'm just gonna... an index on that uh, particular key. Uh, yes, we can. Um, so that key. So in Arango, this will be um, the primary key, and then you could do secondary um, uh, indexes, like on a name, for example. And that would speed it up, right? Because it would have that information up front already. So it doesn't have to go and fetch it. Correct. It's just like any other database where you can go ahead and do, uh, create indexes. Yeah. Okay. And it'll, and, and, uh, Arango will build it, build indexes on its own as well. So um, that's how the things will be tied together. Okay. Now, if you look at... So I ran, so if you look at a little more complex object, so user is pretty easy. Now we go to a, a component version um, and you can see where it gets a little more complicated. So this is the, um, the, the SID of the whole object, including all of the nested objects. So we can see here, we have a different domain because we have a different domain name, we're gonna have a different uh, key for that domain. Um, so here's like the global domain and you can see how the SID was generated is different than uh, this SID here because of the, the, uh, the data is different. So mm -hmm. we have all these, um, so we have a domain which is nested object. Uh, then we have an owner, which is a user object, which has a domain, which is an, another nested object and same thing and so forth. And then we go into our, like our, our packages. Um, so this is all the, um, the packages that, are, are de that we're dependent upon and they have their keys and the key of the keys and stuff like that. So when we look at this whole um, this big structure for a, a component version, we have all this nested data. And when we flatten it out, let me turn on word wrap here. Whoa, so everything here, like the service owner has now got its own unique key and that data is yeah. being kept unique. And the, oh, so everything, well, not everything, I don't I don't know what the right terminology word to use, but I'm looking at the the braces, right? Yeah. And then I'm seeing where there's where there's nested data, then it starts getting then it gets a unique key. Yeah. So when we when we go and flatten out or make or denormal on uh, I'm sorry, when we normalize all of this this data up here, we end up with this smaller um string that actually gets added into uh, NFT storage. Mm. Now the word wrap's a little funny here. Let me see if I can fix it. I see what you better. mean. Because there's that nested data with its unique key. For yeah. So here's key. here's like here's like the consuming um key and so this is the consuming object and that's the key the sid that's going to be on uh on nft storage and mm -hmm. here's like one of the domains the main domain here's our license so everything gets mm -hmm. flattened out now if we look at it from and that's unique right in nft storage it'll never change right so anytime that data changes that key will always know about what that new change is or whatever right um if we if you change the data you get a new sid and new uh data stored in nft storage okay oh you do uh, get a new sid okay so it gets yep. updated in a sense okay yeah you but never it update it you just create new ones <laughs> oh it just creates a copy really so it's always got a reference to go back if it needs to yeah, if it really needed to, I see. Yep. So, so historically, a unique key. Yeah, so historically, everything's persisted forever. <laughs> yeah, 
That makes sense. Wow, that's a lot of data. <laughs> well, that's why we're doing the normalization uh, of that. So when we look at that big structure here, all this data, and we actually go through and look at um, what needs to be added into um, NFT storage, um, here's like the providing list. Um, mm. And this is the, the, so this would be the key in NFT storage, the SID, and this would be the data that gets added to uh, NFT mm. storage. And then mm. here's the readme file. Mm. Oh, there's a readme file. And here oh, is a, an empty is domain, a, for example. This is a whole new world for me. Eh? Storing data in a very unique way. Yep. And here's like the, the swagger data. Mm. So what ends up happening is um, now if we get into the like the application, let's see, this is going to be probably the highest no, level. A, can I ask something quickly? So yeah. that unique key is almost like the file name, really. right? It is the file name particular data at that point in time how it was and if it got changed it would take get a new key with those same object types with the new data correct wow so here is here is the user so here's a stupid question yep. i want to give you a pdf file and i've got some random key like that would i give you that key name <laughs> if you give me know. if you give me the key name we can go get the pdf file from ipfs Wow, but you'd have to have that whole name. Well, you have to have this. I have to have this whole long string. So how uh, would basically you make the this, SID. So this is basically Web three stuff, right? Is it? Yeah, Am I understanding this correctly. It, it so, has a lot of lot of overlap with Web three. Yeah. So how how would how would we share data? Would, would it be like DNS? Would there be a easy to remember human name that would mask this crazy key? No. No. That's the oh, wow. that that actually is where the XRPL ledger comes into play, uh, and it maps the keys with the data. Yeah. So, like, I so, could say, "Hey, Steve, did you read my I don't know my readme.pdf, for example? Let's call it. I'm, I don't want to go to Steve and say, "Hey, I, did you read my B A F K R E I blah blah." Right. And what <laughs> you would do is that that's where the ledger comes into play because the ledger in the metadata when we go and record that we're adding a, basically we have a transaction saying, I'm adding a new readme file. Um, it's gonna record the date and time and who who um, saved that readme file. And then also it's gonna give us metadata that we can put, like you said, a more a more common name into. And yeah, then like it would, right. yep. And then it would give us, a, a, gives, gives us a place to put the, the SID so we can actually go get the contents of the readme file. Sheepers. Okay, so it's like DNS for file systems, I guess, in some way. But that's what ledgers are doing. Yeah, that's what the ledgers are doing um, when we when we go and, and store these things. Now, what you can see is um, when we look at the amount of data that we're gonna be storing, um, because we are referencing uh, like the global domain was referenced like three or four times. Uh, mm -hmm. We're only gonna we're only gonna persist it once into um, the uh, the NFT storage. Mm -hmm. But each each object, so we had our user object is going to reference this domain, and mm -hmm. let's see if it shows up. So there it is, the second time. So there, mm. there's it, it, it referenced once in the user object, and then it's referenced again in the creator object. Uh, is that to map that information together? Yep. So we can follow, when you start following all the keys, um, yeah. you can go from this cryptic format back to this format that you can actually read. Yes. So all what all the marshalling and unmarshalling is doing is transforming the readable data that's in um, the pretty structure that we can use from a programming perspective mm -hmm. um, and move that um, denormalized data into a normalized format that we use for storage. 
Okay. And that's where the abstract layer, uh, the data abstraction layer is going to come into play is um, going through and making sure that all the uh, objects are persisted. And if they're, if they don't exist, add them, if they do exist, um, you know, just make, you know, all that, that process. So a ledger is, system, sorry, is like the DNS, DNS server <laughs> of IPFS. <laughs> Which one is that, Sasha? Go again. Is, is, I don't know if I'm saying this right. Uh, is the ledgers are kind of like the DNS servers of, um, of, of NFT storage in a sense. It is, well, the ledger is literally that. It, it's a historical, um, yeah. Uh, and then version of what's happened uh over time so with all those crazy keys but then yep. it allows us as humans to be able to share just an easy file name instead of having to remember all that crazy yep uh, numbers and, and that like that. that's one thing i haven't figured out yet um that we'll need to uh address is yeah. if somebody does a rename yeah. How does um, that? Yeah. Exactly. How, how does, does that, that happen? happen? Do because yeah. the, the the history is there forever. Yes. Um. So this data, the old data, the name is there. Yeah. And on a rename, uh, we could tag something as deleted, and then added. Um. So it's actually like two transactions in the ledger. Um, we'll have to see when we get to that point, how we want to handle like a rename because you yeah. still need to maintain a, histor a historical point of view. So mm -hmm. all this IPFS data doesn't go away. We just keep on adding mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. Um, but on the ledger side, we have to figure out how we're going to track like a rename. Exactly. Because it's still the same data, but it's just got a different name now. Right. So how does that look? Uh, yeah. It's different data because it's different. Anytime oh, you change different. the data, you get a yeah. new, um, you key. get a new key, but like it could be the same file, but it's just got a different name now. Right. So it'll create a whole new key and how do yep. you, oh yeah, I see what you're saying. How does it tie it back to what it was before? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. This Sorry, Ovind and uh, Utkosh, I hope, you got, I hope I'm not slaying you guys. So this, yeah. this data that we're looking at here with all the, the key value pairs, so the, the keys on this side, like this mm. is going to be one of the keys, and this is going to be the value. Um, each one of these basically lines is going to be a um, what is going to be added to what they call a car file. Um, oh. a, a content addressable archive. Mm -hmm. So is we that can, all the keys compressed into like one file, really? You can think of a tar file. Yeah. So That's if you had a, you know, a tar file, you can create, you can yeah. tar up a directory. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is a tar file is, is, is um, tarring up these, this data. That's all and these it, keys for yep. all this data smashed in there so that you can read it or understand it all as a as a complete unit right yep so a car file is you take all these crazy keys and the corresponding data and yeah. you call these um going methods uh to go ahead and and pass in the data and one is, what ends up happening is um you add each one of these uh keys into as a layer into the car file. And then after you've done all that, you create a root key of all the keys. So you just think if you have keys of keys, because what you want to do is you want to make sure that nobody can manipulate them. So all yeah, this so is immutable, immutable data. <laughs> so it's a parent key for all the keys yep. within the car file. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like an inception. Yeah, it feels very. It feel it does feel like that, right? It feels like um, uh, it feels like what's that book? Nineteen eighty four. Uh, yeah, anyway. Yeah, it feels very. It feels very. You know, it's just, I don't know. Because the, the whole kind of... the whole goal is to make sure that none of the data gets messed with. Good question, and Ivan, are you learning something here? Because I feel <laughs> like my I lost more hair, but not that I have any. <laughs> 
I am just trying to understand the whole scenario. <laughs> yes, little bit up for me. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So no. So this is going to be like the zip of the future, right? We're we going to have multiple keys of data, really compacted up into a car file, which has a unique root key for all of that those keys. Yeah. So a car file is a zip file for IPFS storage. <laughs> I feel like what we're learning is well, I'm, feels like for me what I'm learning is that is like. Be, is like definitely back to the future. It's like futuristic stuff that we're going to, the way the internet's going to work. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Uh, uh, Steve, can yep. we do some session like we did last, like two, three months ago? Yeah. Like you give us some issues and we I and Sasa solve it live with you. Can we do something like this with Go? Yes, we will do some uh, paired programming on this stuff uh, as well. And my, I mean, it's the, amazing. Super, yeah, super awesome. and I'll lay out some. Um, my next step is to um, put together a sample microservice mm. um, that we can start with, and then Arvin oh. will have to what we'll to re repeat that, kind of copy that sample microservice into the, all the new um, repositories. So I'll be. Ask? Yep. Oh, sorry, no. Wait, wait till you finish. Sorry, sorry. I'll just. So what we'll need to do is I'll, I'll set I'll bootstrap all the repositories from the GitHub mm. side, and then Arvin, mm. you have that issue assigned to you to um, kind of populate all of them with the sample, and mm. I'll I'll get you started on that front. So that Go code that you showed us would mm -hmm. that be compiled in a pipeline? Like let's take a like I'm thinking because I'm so used to using Maven and all these Java projects that I've been containerizing, but now if we were containerizing that Go code. There would be some type of compiling going on, right? To com compile that uh, program and put it in a con in a container, right? Uh, is, what ends up right? happening is you is there a um, bold file that's going to be put in here, like a YAML file, or go YAML, like a type of YAML file or something for a pipeline? Uh, what ends up happening? Let me find the file. Sorry, I hope I'm not going in a different direction. Yep. You just tell me if I am. So Go is going to. Um, You've referenced the repository, mm. so all of the so Go when you create your executable for Go, it all comes from source. Mm. So you you literally fetch all the code um, from source, and then that gets compiled into the executable. So uh, when yeah. we write our microservice, we'll include our um, it's called the or is the package name? The sec so we'll, we'll bring in the Ortelia sec commons uh, repo. Yeah. As a dependency. Yeah. A dependency. At the microservice. Makes sense. Because that's your toolbox so, for all the data denormalization right. and normalization. Yeah. Mm. So it's like we are creating our own package called a CSC common. Correct. And it's going to be our, our reusable code package. Ah. Uh. That's a good question, oh. Owen. Thanks. That helped me understand something. Yeah. So you'll that's, you'll notice that um, that's the, why you've called it commons. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And there's no there's like no main. Um, usually you have like a main.go um, as like the entry point to run the program mm -hmm. from. And because mm -hmm. this is a reusable package, there is no um, main uh, Go program. Mm -hmm. So Steve, when wow. you're saying uh, it will be an artifact, so that means this will not be a microservice, right? No, this will not be. Um, the The commons will not be a, a. It's just a library, like in like in Java, like when it'll you be a, a Java. Library. Basically, is a Java library yeah. you can think of. Yes. So okay. Like, so yeah, we'll yeah, just, that makes sense to me. Build an artifact and um, we'll be using this. Yes. Okay. So let me. This isn't it's quite there yet, but let me go ahead and bring this up. Is it is it like when you're building a um, uh, I like I know when I've ripped apart um, mono repos for a Java application, I've had to make sure that the Nexus server has the common library accessible because all the microservices when we build them will look for that as the common, you know, like the, a common package base. Correct. So that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that makes sense. Can okay. Yeah. yeah, no, that makes complete sense. So like when we build the microservice, it'll go, hey, where's this package? And it'll pull this common down and it'll be, be part of the microservice, right? So that it, yeah. okay, cool, that makes sense so, to me. So like 
it is providing an abstraction layer to all the microservice or we are writing on top of this library or package so what i can do is um like in this case so this is like the the basically the um the microservice uh mm -hmm. main program and then mm -hmm. look at user does here it, what 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 does it use to i mean how do you specify for it to pull this package oh, so all i have to do us. is um <laughs> so i bring in uh what is the file called is it like a main what is it a go main.go uh, user.go oh it's a user.go so i just say I go off and get um that version i actually have to give it a like a tag so we'll say v1 Okay. And that's going to bring in, I haven't published it yet. So that's how we're getting it. It's underlined, but I, yeah, that's yeah. how I would reference um, that this library here. Is this your Maven file like in Java? No, nope, this in is the sense. actual source code. Actual source. Yeah. Okay. Cause it doesn't have, it doesn't do, do it that way. I know. Uh, I yeah. Understand. Because it, it, because it, it brings it in from, from the source code. Yeah. It's all sense. based on source code. So okay. it'll look like that. So I'll say go out and go out to GitHub, go out to Artilius org, go to the yeah. sec commons and bring down the V1 release. Uh, the V1 release will be in the GitHub repo, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, ah, cool. And then uh, it's a different way. Hey? It's different to, I'm so used to Java with Maven files and those type of things. Yeah. It's, it's, it's you don't, and, go to, go we go don't do anything else. Um, on the application side, right? Like we do uh, in Maven. In Maven, we have no, to define the, for something. The only thing that you'll have is you have the, um, it'll, there's a command go, uh, go mod tidy that will go and update your dependency file. So mm -hmm. this, think of this as your, um, in the yeah, Python this is the world. File. Sorry, this was the file I was also trying to. Sorry, Steve, so I yeah. wasn't asking it correctly, but what Utkosh asked it the right way. Um, this is what I was trying to understand. This file. Yeah. It's almost like package.json in a way. Exactly. I just was going to say that this <clears throat> is just like package.json. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> this is what I was trying to ask you. Yeah. Thanks, Utkosh. <laughs> so this this is now. the the file that gets updated, and you have to make the reference to um, in the source code of what you want to use. Okay. Wow. Interesting. Wow. Nice. Mm. So some of the things that we will need um, is if we go back to our example here. So where are we pushing our artifacts, Steve? Um, mm. the, That's a good question. So um, on this side, when we're looking at the, the sec comments, uh, that's just going to be a, a release, uh, a GitHub uh, release, you know, V1, V2, all those type of things. Oh. And then on the microservices side, oops, wrong. Let me see. There it is. So on the microservices side, um, these will include the, the release over on from the GitHub repo. Uh, but these, because they're going to be microservices, will need to have a, um, will be built into a Docker container and have all the Helm charts and all those fun things uh, mm -hmm. to make them run as a microservice in Kubernetes. And one last question. So are we still going to have that um, that kind of architecture where uh, we were, you know, triggering one Helm chart and that was spawning uh, other Helm charts? Uh, yes, we will still have the parent Helm chart and the child Helm charts. So that's still uh, in play, that, right? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense because it's just we don't. Uh, the Helm chart doesn't care about the application code, right? It's not no, caring. No, it about just that. It cares it's, about the container no, image. Tag. Yeah, the container image and all that type of thing. Sure. Guys, if I drop off, it's like because I run out of electricity. Just letting you know. Yeah. yeah. So, like, we will make one umbrella child for all of this, right? There'll be uh, one one Why Helm chart fun? for microservice, and then there'll be a parent Helm chart for that brings all of them together. Uh, but it's uh, just a thought here. So um, that is like increasing the complexity. So what I was thinking, is it possible to avoid that? 
Uh, no, because there's um, the only the only way to really do an install of the of all the microservices uh, in one go is to have the parent uh, Helm chart. The other way is to make one big giant repo. Oh, and how will how many new microservices we will create in this? I think like eighteen. Wow, that's a huge number. Ah, uh, that's not that bad. <clears throat> yeah. And oh, we have the uh, we have the automation in place from the existing architecture um, to automatically create all of the Helm, you know, maintain all the Helm charts, including the parent one. So the next step is um, if we look at the. When we when we go and and marshal and unmarshal things, we're putting them into this this map. Uh, this map is what's going to need to be uh, persisted uh, in the Arango database as well as uh, IPFS. Um, so there's going to be that's where the the abstraction layer is going to be. So um, the marshal NFT. Uh, may change slightly to deal with um, talking to the abstraction layer to uh, go and get things for me. Because um, one of the things that we want to uh, do is um, at the microservice level, I can go from go from one structure, one format, you know, from this nice pretty uh, structure, um, this Golang structure into um, the appropriate JSON. But then that's all we want the microservice to do. Uh, we want to then pass off that that data to the database abstraction layer for the database abstraction layer to deal with storing it in um, in Arango uh, and storing in NFT storage, and then doing not only storing but also fetching um, mm -hmm. when we need to go get something. That that database abstraction layer should be the one that does all that um, back and forth cool. for us. So this package gives our microservices the capability to be able to go back and forth between NTF, uh, NF, NFT. Uh, the, and the, the, the commons, um, the common uh, function, the package. common fac yeah. package will be so the one package, responsible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if our microservice, if we build a microservice and it has that package included, it has the, the, uh, yeah, it, it it'll has, have the it capability has, um, cap yeah the logic it has the logic to be able to speak speak nft and to speak um aranga yep and exactly speak ledger basically yep. it's creating a language for it right it's kind of like the matrix uh i need yep. i need to know how to fly a helicopter i need to know how to convert the data uh, so i just pull it down from the common package pull the common package down yeah and what it does is on on the uh on the microservice side it makes it really simple to um you know you know we'll have like we could have a possibly a, a database initialization routine um and then let's see here this is where we're creating like a new book for example yeah um we, this would be saying oh i want to create a new user um these are the fields for the user and then I'm going to pass it off to instead of uh, this is talking to Rango di directly. I'm going to then talk to the common code, and the common code is going to take care of doing all the back end heavy lifting for saving the new user into the right places. Yeah, and super then, smart, man. It's like a pluggable, it's almost having like a plugin that you can just plug in anyway, right? Yep. So on the microservice side, it becomes we keep the complexity very simple um mm. you know because the we we're going to have the database abstraction layer that's going to allow us to do um handle all that work uh for us now on a database abstraction layer i don't know at this time if it's going to be able to be 
generic so there's like one function that does everything for all the different mm -hmm. objects or if each object has to have its own function to be able to go back and forth um mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter um it would be nice if we could have a generic one but sometimes making something generic ends up being overly complicated <laughs> yeah it starts to get bloated right yeah exactly you try to do too many edge cases where mm. you end up doing you know if you do it uh, on an object by object basis yes you have some duplicate code but overall it's simpler steve why don't you incur a technical debt there in a sense because of um is it and what and what about and also um stability in your application now you like you say you're trying to build this code or to accommodate for so many different things right is that the idea and then it, that could end up being a um actually a, a performance bottleneck do you think exactly and so we'll have to, we'll have to and, see and to maintain this... it is going to be a nightmare too right it just depends on on how generic Ukarsh can make it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, is it Utkosh? Utkosh, have you got that one? <laughs> uh, I I have some questions. Uh, like the first one that we are using any cloud for hosting the new 18 microservice. And the second question is that we are using normal REST API or we are using gRPC or trpc. On the microservice call? Uh, it will be so the um, the microservices will talk RESTful APIs. So they'll have just a well known, um, you know, API URL that they'll that they'll you'll set up the routes for. So each microservice will have their their um, uh, API URL. And because we're going to be including um, the common code, uh, we don't need to have a microservice to microservice uh, transaction. Um, I did look at that. Um, I think it's just going to be uh, add to too much complexity. So instead, the common code will connect to the database and uh, NFT storage directly. Yeah, um, that it is, makes sense to me. It, it is theoretically sense. where you could go from one microservice from this microservice to a database handler microservice that does mm -hmm. all that stuff. But it's, I think it just um, complicates it too much. Now, this is what I've seen a lot, this pattern that you're using, Steve, but in the Java side, right? With a common, it's a common package. It's stored in Nexus. Uh, any microservice that needs that common package just fetches it from Nexus. Simple. Yep. And it's also very much easier to maintain, right? Yeah, um, the one the one thing that ends up happening is if you change the common code, let's say we mm -hmm. release a new version, um, you could break everything, right? For we have others? to go and rebuild all of the ones that are dependent yeah. upon it. Yeah, that's um, true. But that's the only that's the downside uh, versus doing a um, a reusable microservice for the database handler. So how do you look at it? Do you look at it like the commons gives us way more advantages and disadvantages? So we go that route, right? Is, is that kind of the idea? It's easier to program um, using the reusable code. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, you have all, you have, you have access to all the structures, you have access to all the functions and methods and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so from a programming perspective, it's easier to, to work with. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the kind of the trade-off. Yeah, there's always going to be a trade-off everywhere. So you have to just figure out for your specific use case, which is what has the most advantages, right? Versus disadvantages. Yep. Especially in an open source project where you've probably got people coming and going, right? You need to have something that's common all the time. It makes sense. Or any project, I guess. And, and, and Ukarsh, if you figure out that it makes more sense to do a microservice for the database handler abstraction, um, just let me know. And uh, it's not, you know, we could swap it in and out, you know, at, mm -hmm. the, at this point. Um, can I ask a kind of a weird question maybe? Um, so you, could you make that common package actually into a microservice? Uh, it's kind of split because you need part of the, the common code functionality to format the data so that mm -hmm. the other side that you're going to pass it off to the data is coming into the right format for the other side to deal with. 
because I was thinking of it as a connection pooler, like, you know, in PostgreSQL, you get the connection pooler. It would be a similar type of concept. It's like a pool. It would be a service that's running to pull connections for any anything, anywhere in the application to be able to use that functionality, right? Yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's like, um, it just, just depends if we can um, get the, if the data coming over, if the, the data abstraction layer can deal with generic data, then mm. we can kind of make it um, a microservice. Um, mm. It's an interesting des design decision, right? Yeah. So probably quite a very home. crucial one. Mm. Yeah, of course. Yeah, sorry. One, one second. So there is this common application. So common application will deal uh, with the methods like uh, normalization, marshalling, and unmarshalling of data. Right. And uh, behind that, we'll have that abstraction layer, right? Correct. And uh, let's suppose we have one implementation that says um, RangoDB plus uh, NFT. Right. And, okay. So, okay. So let's suppose there is another implementation. So do you think like the marshalling and unmarshalling will make sense there? Um, so... <laughs> If we, let's say we do um, Arango plus NFT, and then we have Arango plus OCI, um, we'd have two different implementations. Um, the normalized data isn't good, going to change. It's just going to be how it's stored in the persistence layer. Okay. Oh, this is interesting, right? So it's like you, whatever you decide now, it's either going to could be a good decision or could be a tough decision, right? In terms of maintenance and all that type of thing, right? Yeah. Is that kind of where we're at that point, right? Yeah. And we'll have to see when we start playing with um, like Arango, what Arango needs in order to store stuff. If it's going to need a... Um, can the local Terraform environment that we have help in this decision? Is there something we could do there to um, make it? Well, what we'll need to do is uh, we'll need to create um, a set of Helm charts that include standing up an Orango uh, database instead of Postgres. Mm. Okay. But you could deploy that alongside it, right? Just in your, you could have... Could well, what we're gonna and, we're gonna have to have a whole whole new set of uh, basically a whole new version of the application. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, that's true. So we're not stepping on top of each other. We'll have a whole new front end. We'll have a whole new you know microservices. Oh, uh, yeah, because this is the whole new Otilius, really, right? It's yep. the new Otilius first. So you keep the old on its own, carry on running, and now we're building a whole new, basically a whole new Otilius. Yeah, that makes yep. sense. That makes sense. So I probably could make a new Terraform. Oh, sorry, Ovin. Oh, gosh. So uh, what I was asking, so all the methods that are there in abstraction layer, they will uh, like directly communicate to RangoDB, right? Correct. There would be additional ad hoc met method or function that will be responsible for, you know, um, uh, polling in a, like, uh, in a finite intervals and checking if the particular data is uh, being, you know, persisted in the NFT, right? Right. Yeah. Okay, so so the, what we'll probably need is, um, well, depending on how we implement it uh, and depending, on, it really depends on how big the code base gets. But if the database, database abstraction layer isn't too large of a code base, then we can have that support NFT and OCI at the same time in the same code base. Um, if it ends up growing where it's uh, the code base ends up being too big, then we would split it into um, two different code bases. Uh, um, you know, Arango plus NFT would be one repository. Arango plus OCI would be in the other repository. And depending upon which one you want to use would be which um, on the Helm chart side, which one we're going to stand up um, mm. as uh, at that level. Could I oh, okay. create a, sorry, uh, could I create a clone, uh, just another, and I could create a Terraform environment 
but just with the new setup. Like so, there'd be two different environments: one with the old, mm. old Otilius yes. and one with the new Otilius. You could do that, right? I could do that. Yes, we'll we will need that. Okay, cool. And that makes sense. if if and if we are creating any middleware, that we will define it in the common section or in the microservice part. Uh, which part, Arvind? The mic the middleware section. Uh not sure yet which where it would end up. Yeah. Because otherwise it will overcomplicate both the stuff, the microservice and the SCSC common. And we can define it in the common section so it will be easier to patch and keep the microservice clean and easier. Right. And and Ukarsh, if you could look into um if the abstraction layer can be, you know, take any generic um, set of JSON or data and, and persist it, or if you have to have a, um, a well-defined, you know, Golang structure to do the persistence, um, you have to let me know on that. Because that will kind of depend, that'll kind of uh, dictate whether we can do a database abstraction microservice or if we have to compile it in as part of the common code library. Steve, can I come back again? So we just need to figure out on the, the database abstraction layer how it how that's going to interact with Arango. Okay. Okay. If it if it has to when when you talk to Arango, if it needs to be a well-defined uh, Golang structure, or if it can be a generic JSON string that you can persist to Arango. Is that or okay, not, I want to say, say a generic. I want to say a generic um, JSON string, but a well-defined JSON string. Hmm. Uh, okay. Is that your is that your code piece that's talking to the database or driver? Is that, what you, is that what you guys are yeah. talking about, or am I completely missing the point? Yeah. No, that that's the yeah. the database abstraction layer is the the one. That yeah, talks like to your the like your JDBC driver, right? Are you looking for the Go one? Uh, it's it's above that. Yeah, it the, instead of each microservice con connecting to a Rango, mm. we'll have the common code uh, talk to a Rango. Yeah. So in Java, we have uh, some properties based on dialect. We can identify uh, which implementation to run right the similar mm. kind mm -hmm. exactly I've, yeah i've seen that in java too yeah uh can't yeah, in, in, in java head. it'll end up like in a in a like a tomcat application it'll end up in the web.xml is like your connection strings yeah yeah connection strings yeah. and the same thing happens with the rango uh you have to have a connection string where the database lives yeah Wow, what a cool project. Cheapest. Yeah, it's, it's making a lot more sense now. Yeah, it's making a lot more sense now for me too. I really understand that. Uh, thanks, Steve, for going yep. through that. So what I'll do is I'll put together a, um, a sample microservice. Uh, and once I have that uh, in place, then we can replicate that sample into all the uh, microservices. So we have uh, starting points for everybody to start working on a, um, the mic, uh, you know, individual microservices. So if anybody, anybody wants to pick up a microservice to work on, they'll have the, the data there. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Well, we got like 17 or 18 of them to do, so. So you're saying I'm gonna get good. First, I'm yep. going to irritate everybody because I'm definitely the slowest here with Go and programming. I'm the slowest in the development. I will take a lot more time. Oh, that's me and you, Arvind. We'll need, I'm definitely going to need Stephen, of course. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure we do some uh, pair programming. Yeah, but it's such a cool project, man. This is like really cool. All right. Any other Thank questions? You. Uh, just, just we can start the UI UX work also. Yes, that will be part take, of it as well. It, it will take a lot of time. 
Well, if we get the data moving, if, the, if we get the data looking good, uh, the front end comes together pretty easy. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's really great. So on the UI side, the screens would be same, right? The layouts and everything. It just we have to use right there. Um, I think the layout will be similar. Um, there will be some things that we will want to change. Um, so like one of the problems with the existing UI is all the tables go and pull all the data. So if you have, you know, uh, 5,000 rows of components, you get all 5,000 coming back uh, instead of it being smart and bringing back subsets. So I think that'll be some of the one of the main changes that we'll we'll need to do in the Riot JS is how we handle um, big data for uh, lists. Okay. And one of the other things that we have uh, that we should probably implement is you know how like um, you know in Docker Hub and those things you can tag. You know, you can associate a tag to, you know, say this is for a Linux container versus a Windows container. So you can add the, the Linux tag versus Windows tag. I think we need to do that tagging mechanism as well to help do the filtering um, and make things easier to, to navigate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tagging is powerful. Uh, cool, I'm looking forward to this. So the front end is going to need some work. Mm -hmm. I think some of the detail screens, like the details of a component version and application version, I think those are going to remain pretty close to what they are today, with all the boxes and stuff. But um, I think the list views are we're going to we're going to need to and some of the net, just the basic navigation we we need to work on. Is is right, yeah, it's in a similar vein to like Angular or something like that? It's just yep. static. Right. Uh, it's a, it's like, um, yeah, like Angular. It has a templating engine and templating, routing, that kind of thing. It has a router, yeah. And uh, but the main thing is, it's based on components. So you in your template, you tag where a component's going to go, and then yeah. it's kind of sucks in that based on that placeholder, this component and drops in all the code for it. Okay. Uh, um, also, the angle, the Angular release is new version in which it removes the anti-module part, and it just introduces the signal property. So we can just write a standalone equal to true, and we can do all the stuff without using the anti-module. So like it is also changing stuff. Right. And um, one of the things about the Riot JS is the Docker Hub UI is based on Riot JS. So we have a sample, you know, big application that's been that everybody's using. That oh, is Docker Hub based on Riot JS. That's cool. It, yeah, you have to go to the Docker Hub UI repo, and you can see that it's all based on Riot JS. Geez, what an awesome example to have. <laughs> yeah. So if we go and copy that as our starting point, then you know, and in that structure, then we have a, mm. a you know a good good layout to work with, and then we can work our way from there, and modify it to suit Ortilius. Maybe yep. we can even improve it. Yep, exactly. All right, I got to run off to my next meeting. Anybody else have any thanks. other questions? No, this was great. Thanks, Steve, for your time. Thanks, Utkosh. Thanks, Owen. all right. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, have a great have a great day, everyone.